Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is the co-founder and CEO of Curie Health, Neil Kosla. Neil, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me, Jared. I'm excited to be here. Super excited to have you. You and I were laughing a bit because, you know, I feel like we're we're in the late 400 episodes. I'm like, how have you not been on at this point? So I'm so glad that we're finally doing this. And maybe maybe it's good though because now we have even more of a story, right? I uh, and then having you on here, but but yeah, that makes me feel a lot worse because that makes me realize I'm I was priority number 400 and something. <laughs> no. and, you know, you and as we said, the digital health community is small. So if I'm number 400 out of number four of 400 people, it's all right. It's you're not making a great me feel. Look. You're making me feel awful right now. I mean, you know, reverse it on my end too. It's like, how did how did we miss this? No, I we we've we've heard uh, you and I were chatting, right? We've there was we've heard about each other before episode, you know, almost 500, uh, and and now we're finally doing this. So super excited to have you here. Um, let's let's start out with the question I always ask people. Assume there's some people listening to this that have for some reason never heard of the company. What do you tell them? What, what's the what's the explanation behind what you do? Sure. Um, I mean, the the one sentence elevator pitch is uh, we're a virtual primary care company that uses AI to help our physicians provide more efficient care, uh, more effective care, and ultimately more engaged care. Um, and we think that last piece is is increasingly one of the the biggest and most important pieces here is. When you think about the opportunities for AI to help in healthcare, there's a huge opportunity on the administrative side. And we do a little bit of that, but for the most part, aren't concerned with that. Our concern is really how do you take a clinician, which is a really scarce resource, and make them broadly available in the same kind of high touch and highly personalized manner that people expect uh, when they get, say, a concierge physician or in an advanced primary care model. And our thesis is, is that one of the best opportunities in healthcare right now is to use AI to help support the clinician so they can deliver that kind of personalization and access. Um, and the engagement piece ends up being a really, really important factor here where you know, most virtual care to date has really struggled to generate ongoing engagement. Um, and part of that is, uh, part of that is, you know, how do you develop great products with great usage patterns? But part of that, our theory is also that historically digital health products have been rationed to some degree because the cost of delivering these services is incredibly high. And so if it costs you as much or more to deliver a service, then you have to try and find this balance. And this is where we think AI can be this big unlock where, you know, you can have a provider make a clinical decision and then the AI can work with the patient to check in to make sure they're following their care plan to evolve it as, you know, as we're learning, you know, what their particular barriers are and then to triage things back to the provider. So, like I said, we, we really have increasingly focused on this kind of engagement piece is a huge part of expanding access uh, using kind of AI enabled care models. So a lot in there, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. It's interesting because obviously this space, it, it looks a lot different than even it did a couple of years ago, right? During the pandemic when everything was just booming, it seemed like you only leverage virtual care at that time, right? No, very few people wanted to go to the doctor's office. Um, and, you know, the other day I, I've seen, obviously things have changed a little bit since then. It's not to the full, it's not to the same extent it was during the pandemic, but the other day I did a little exercise of, I wrote down what, what I hope the healthcare journey of like tomorrow looks like through my lens and how it would impact me. And I was actually surprised how much of it was still virtual care. Like it, there was not, you know, if I need to check in with my doctor once every few weeks, once every few months, do I want to go into, even though I said, I don't mind going to the doctor's office. So it is funny oh, that when you finally do that exercise, you see that. So my, my question to you is, what do you see the next wave of virtual care looking like? Because obviously COVID was one of those waves. What's kind of the next wave we're either in or we're heading towards now? 
I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. I think there's like this implicit assumption in this space that like virtual care and telemedicine didn't work. Um, and the question then is like, okay, if they didn't work because we've kind of reset to pre COVID baselines of people accessing virtual services, um, then is, virtu- is it, either two things are true. Either we're doing it wrong or, you know, we're in a world where patients just don't want to access services virtually. And I, I believe that for the most part, we are doing it wrong. Like the idea that people in this special flower of an industry don't want to access convenient, low cost, easy to use services the way they access everything else in their life. It seems far fetched to me. Um, that being said, like when I look at what some of the learnings are, I, I think it's very clear that, um, we have to move to a world where video based visits like this synchronous live we get on a call is a um is a fraction of care because if we really think about the advantages of going virtual a, a big chunk of them come from moving from the 15 minute office based visit to a more uh, what I'll call fluid kind of ongoing mode of access. And when you look at like systems like Kaiser, where patients are constantly using their portal and accessing care in digital forms first, you realize that it's a matter of incentives as well as like developing the right modes of access. And so I think what you'll see over the next few years is a lot of patients who, um, or a a lot of services who start to offer more asynchronous forms of care, uh, who start to offer more AI forward forms of care um, that allow patients to kind of have, we call them internally like the seven second interaction. So instead of the seven minute visit, we want you to have a seven second visit, which is like, hey doc, I took my meds or I didn't take my meds or I had this complication, what should I do? And you might not hear anything back until the next day, unless it's relevant. And it's sort of on the job of the service providers to appropriately respond with the right SLAs, with the right timeframes clinically, um, and so on and so forth. And so that's where we see AI really coming in and, and, and having a big opportunity because we have to move from this idea that everything in healthcare is going to happen only under scheduled appointments where patients are setting aside like a big chunk of their time, whether it be seven minutes, 15 minutes or an hour, but rather that this is something that fits into their life on, an, on a more ongoing basis. Because one of the things that I say that is really hard about building in this space is it's, the only, it's one of the only industries in the world where people don't want what you're selling, but they need it. Um, so, you know, you ask, ask the average patient, like, how much healthcare do you want in your life? They're going to say zero. Um, there are some areas like weight loss and what we're seeing with some of these things around GLP ones that are different, but for the most part, they, they really don't want to touch it, but they know they have to under certain circumstances. And so our big theory is, you know, the easier you make it for patients to touch these things they need, but don't necessarily want to, um, the better off they are. Uh, and the more likely you are to get patients who use the service. And we kind of see this in our data, like we could divide our primary care patients into three buckets, like a third, a third, a third. And the top bucket are using our service four and a half times, uh, four and a half days a month, right? And when you look at what's in those four and a half days, it's everything from I'm referring back to a care plan to I'm sending a one-off message to I'm actually having a visit with a provider in the way that we think of a visit. But you go to most healthcare providers or, you know, even insurance plans working uh, to offer virtual benefits. And you'll sit, you say, yeah, like people use our service four and a half days a month and it blows their mind because they've never, they've never had patients use a healthcare service four and a half days a month. But so much of that is just unbundling and making it appropriate to access it in much easier, smaller, bite-sized ways. And I think the benefits of something like that can really compound because now you can actually work with a patient on an ongoing basis to deliver better clinical outcomes, economic outcomes. And that's where the ROI stories get built from. So um, we really, you know, to your question, what's next? I, we really, really see kind of the next frontier, at least on the consumer and, and the patient facing side being like, how do we make this even more convenient and easier to use? And then, you know, the other piece that has to go hand in hand with that to make these businesses work is utilizing 
you know, AI and other technologies, finding ways to make these services actually lower cost because seven, 10, 15 minutes of a doctor's time doesn't really matter if it's on a video call or in person, it's still the same kind of quantum of, of labor and, and therefore the same cost. Do you ever have moments, obviously it's, it's okay now, but like when you look at when you first started this company and now you look at what AI would have even allowed you to do in the early days or how it might have even shifted how you set up your business on day one. I've been thinking about that a lot. Like when I think back to like the, when we were building the, the credentialing like platform in the early days, I'm like, oh, my, I would have, I would have done so much different if this technology was at where it was today from like, you know, what does the initial portal look like to it? Cause I just, I'll, I'll tell you why I started thinking this way. I, I interviewed uh, James Carrier, one of the general partners at NFX uh, Ventures recently. And he was just telling me how, you know, a lot of people just decide to make a problem better, but what you really should be doing is like thinking it completely from a, like putting a whole different lens on it, right? Like his example, yeah was people are trying to create these better like recruiting softwares. Um, and he was like, but why not? Why do you need a new software? Why can't everything be done in the email? Why isn't email the interface? And there's better tool because he said now with AI, you technically you, you, you can, right? So I've just been rethinking everything. I look at a coffee shop. <laughs> it, it like maybe maybe it's not great, but I would love to hear from your point of view. Like, are there certain things you're like, we can change that now, but man, this would have changed things in the early days. Uh, I mean, certainly I, 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 there's a couple of different things that are coming to mind. Some of them are more internal. Like we, we've been in, we've been working as an AI first company in healthcare since 2017. So when we started, like people thought we were crazy. Nobody really was talking about AI and, um, you know, it's interesting looking back, like some of the bets we made about some of the things we set up internally um, were both right and wrong. Um, and this is kind of more technology side and I'll come to market and product side in a second. But, um, you know, we, we really didn't conceive of just how good AI was going to get it and understanding natural language. Um, and so, you know, ha had I known that, that the, that these systems were going to be just incredibly good at broadly understanding natural language. We were much more at that time trying to build what people would call today, like more domain specific models or things focused only on healthcare. And I think one of the things that's been incredibly interesting to see is how much these generalized models just thrive in healthcare contexts um, and that their general world knowledge helps them, especially in a primary care setting where you're dealing with a lot of people's social factors and other things that come into the visit. So just being able to, I think fundamentally not understanding how much these things were going to be capable of not solving one little narrow task for you, but rather um, kind of understanding the world and being an assistant in that sense uh, in, in a much broader sense, uh, that was a pretty big surprise. And I think it kind of showed up in the product, um, where it really wasn't until the last year or so that we re you know, when we think I I'm thinking about your email example and recruiting, everything that we used to think about was really focused on like the visit and the extension of the visit. And I think what's really changed with these assistants is when you have something that doesn't practice medicine, but has a lot of ability to clinically reason and support a patient, you now can almost give them kind of like ongoing access to their doctor, um, you know, with, with some bounds and constraints uh, and, and other members of their care team quite easily on an ongoing basis. And so we've really had to reframe things from like, hey, we do, we, we do visits and we do visits and then we support the patient on journeys that go beyond that visit to, you know, we have a multiple members of our care team and they, all, one of them is the AI and they all work together in a way that supports the patient on an ongoing basis. And part of our job now is to figure out when the AI needs to be acting. And this is a world we're working towards like, 
when does the AI need to be acting as a behavioral health specialist? Or when does the AI need to triage to the behavioral health specialist? Or when does the AI need to act as, uh, as a coach or as, you know, a PA or any of these things? So this more comprehensive look at like, we have all these different people and all these different kind of versions of the AI, how and when does the right one interface with the patient so that we can keep them happy and healthy on an ongoing basis. It's a very different reframing than the patient comes to us with a problem and we try and solve it. Yeah. Well, then your problem just becomes feeding enough data, right? So it knows when it has to be that particular like persona, right? Um, which is another yeah. interesting problem altogether, but uh, definitely a, a solvable problem. Um, you've You've been building this company now for, um, for a few years, like what, what's still, what, what excites you about the, the opportunity still and what's next for Curai that, that you can share with us here today? Oh, I would just say, um, there's a lot of digital health at all, as a whole, I think is an interesting space where like, you kind of like in the hangover period from the <laughs> pandemic highs and, I think what's really exciting if you're still building in this space now is just how much opportunity there is because, you know, three, four years ago, it was, there were so many people shelling so many different things. And now, you know, it's kind of really, the industry shrunk a little bit and I think it's gotten more focused and disciplined. And so that, that is generally exciting to me and you have, more knowledgeable buyers on the other end. And, and so as a whole, I think it's a better time to operate. Um, you know, as far as like where I think there's opportunities, it, you know, it's exactly in, in what we said. I think for us and for everybody else out there, this isn't rocket science, but the holy grail, whether you're working in, in a particular vertical with a population or in a more generalized kind of primary care setting like us or anywhere else, if you're building a solution for patients um, as a digital health company today, the ability to really build a deep relationship with patients still is the single most differentiating factor. And there are very few cases in which you cannot drive some amount of clinical and economic ROI uh, if you can do that well. And I think that's where we're focusing a lot of our time and doing that in ways that are fundamentally scalable, right? Like the only way we know how to do that historically is sit down with a person and spend all of our time with them. And, and I think we're really excited about AI bringing a level of personalization everything from knowing your cat's name to, uh, to like, obviously understanding a lot of things about your medical history and making sure your provider knows these things about you in a way that allows them to really give you recommendations that apply to your life. Those are the types of things that I think are just weren't possible five years ago. I mean, when we started the idea that it, it, it was always out there, but it wasn't actually possible to just be like, Hey, we're going to take all of Jared's and for all the information we have on Jared. And when Dr. Smith talks to Jared, we're going to make sure everything that they're saying is personalized in a way that's going to be relevant to Jared because Dr. Smith's going to have this distilled understanding of who Jared is and what's important to him and all of these things. And then we're going to be able to continue to support him after that conversation. Um, it's just a very, very exciting version of the future, I think. And I think it has potential to really change uh, the way that healthcare works. So I love it. La last question for you. This is okay. a fun one. I ask a lot of people this. What's something you can laugh about now, but when it happened, you wanted to cry? I can't include... I can't include uh, the 49ers Super Bowl losses, can I? Oh, no, no. But I'm sure a lot of people feel your pain it, there. Should it be? Should it be healthcare or work related? It should be. Yeah. Let's 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 relate it to uh, let's relate it to the company, if possible, or just in, in healthcare in general. Oh wow, this is stumping me. It's fine. This is a it's, really good. Yeah, it's it's my so this is my question for. Anytime I meet, like after having a conversation with someone, because it tells me more, it tells me so much about the person, like 
either what they tell me is like, I don't, maybe that shouldn't have made you want to cry uh, or whatever, you know? Um, for me, it was probably the whole pandemic era. Um, you know, as a company, like we didn't have the same experience of a lot of other virtual care companies where it's just like everything was up and to the right for us. We weren't doing a lot of COVID specific stuff. So we didn't get like the COVID testing, like video, like virtual visit business. Um, you know, we, we had just kind of entered working with the enterprise in the enterprise space. We weren't getting like a lot of the employer adoption of new virtual solutions or anything like that. And so, you know, back then it was like, well, what's wrong with us? Everybody else is growing. Um, and I think in, in many ways I look back and say like, it was, it was very much a distraction for a lot of those companies to go down those paths. So I, I, I get to laugh about it now, but you know, back then it was like, oof, it was a little bit hard to stomach. It was a rough time. It's uh, it made me move. I I was up in in Boston. I live in Florida now, <laughs> and people thought it was just going to be a move shortly for the for the pandemic. But um, now once I realized how easy the airport was here too, I can go anywhere. So, uh, Neil, I want to thank you so much for joining us here today. Hopefully, we can get you on a pan. We're going to be doing some panels on on virtual care. Hope we can get you on one of those at some point. Um, and I'm sure I'll run into you at at some events coming up in the near future. But uh, Absolute pleasure. Wishing you the best of luck, and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jared. It was uh, great to be on the show, and uh, best of luck with everything. 